Yes. Well, well, you know, now that we're on video here. Well, this is the I second. can't believe you totally escaped the video. Well, we, we've got this guy completely <laughs> off the camera. <laughs> I, I, got I, I, have a face, guy over there. I have a face for radio, and I would like to stay on radio. So let's go there. <laughs> All right, here we go. You ready? Yes. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is Bird Shooter. And tonight we're coming to you live from the um, cardiac basement, <laughs> which is, a, a, I don't know if you can, well, on YouTube, I guess you can see it, which we are actually, uh, we are, doing, we're, we're doing, doing a YouTube video right yeah. now. Wow. But uh, on radio, you obviously can't. So, uh, But I'm here with uh, two friends of Bird Shooter, Cardiac to my right, you can't see on camera, <laughs> by design. <laughs> and uh, Requested. Oh, what yeah. is Gary's trail name? Drone Boy. Drone Boy, okay. Yeah, yeah. we're exactly. going to talk about that. If you want to get started, we can actually go into trail names. That would maybe... Yeah, I didn't know that I had a trail. Well, yeah, you did. I remember oh. now where you got it. You got it from that hike yeah. in Colorado. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you, should we should we start with Drone Boy on how he got his uh, yeah, trail? Absolutely. Name? Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you want to know? Well, tell us about your uh, your hike where we dubbed you Drone Boy. Oh yeah. So it was, wasn't an accident. Did you know, there were five of us. It was me, you, George, Steve, and Scott, and um, we went to Aspen up to Maroon Bells and. What was it? Cathedral Lake, I think. Yep, Cathedral Lake. Yeah, we were gonna go up to the Electric Pass, but none of us made it to the Electric Pass. That girl that we met made it to Electric Pass, but that was the first year I had gotten a drone specifically for that trip. The Phantom Four. Yeah, so I got the Phantom Four. And before we talk about the drone, though, it became electric and Electric Pass that day. Like literally, that thunderstorm rolled it in. Was it was crazy. a good thing we weren't up there. Yeah. No, we saw it from down below. Yeah, right. I think we got some pictures and stuff. But and that's we got still, soaked on the hike out. Well, and still to this day, that's one of the greatest drone videos that I have, even though I was still a novice. And you have a drone now, you know. Yeah. You just feel uncomfortable flying and stuff. But it, what was great was it, um, we, we just, it was nice, relaxed, and, and we just went up there. Um, I flew the drone, I think, two or three times over that time. Um, got it about a half mile away, maybe a mile away. It wasn't very far. You know, it didn't look very far in that place, but if I went a mile in Atlanta away, it would be far. So that was the Phantom Four that I got. And then um, that trip, yeah. You had some phenomenal footage. Phenomenal. It actually made the video. We had a lot of good yeah. photography from that trip, both still and short videos, but the, the drone footage made the video. Well, and, and that, that's one thing that you learn on a lot of these trips is if you – if you just introduce yourself to a drone, and now, you know, that was three years ago, four years ago, I think it was 2015, so maybe it was just two years ago. But if you look at your pictures and you look at some video that you do, the drone just takes it to a new level. And, you know, on this Machu Picchu trip that we're going to talk about, I couldn't take my drone. And you tried trying to, yeah, and yes, and I'll, I can talk about that too, but... Um, Essentially, when I'm going over all the video and the, and the photos and stuff like that, you realize that the drones just take it to another level when you're looking at um, where you are in, in the wilderness or out on the trail. Um, you can't get an angle like that. Do you, do you have anything to say to the backcountry listeners that may oppose drones? <laughs> if, <wilderness? laughs> yeah, if, you, if you want to use my reference code for, for DJI credit so that I can get a little uh, thing, I'll, 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 I'll try and do that. I, honestly, I know there are. When we were out in Aspen, we had that lady. Said you were number one. Well, yeah, she kind of was not happy that I had a drone and that I was flying. And, and what you find is there's two two people, and it's right down the middle. There are the people who want the solitude and don't want drones. And then there's the people who will come up to you and ask you about what's that. Can I see? Can you see this? And they, they're excited about it. And then when you see the actual pictures and stuff, they, they love drones. But there are those people, and I'm sure there's the backcountry, um, you know, folks who F you, and, you know. $5,000 fine in a national park to fly a drone. Yes. And, so there are definitely yeah. parts of the wilderness where they are. Yeah, if, if you're going to fly a drone out there, you got to know the rules. And, and the rules right. are if there's emergency vehicles around or emergency rescue operations you don't fly you just don't because they have to ground all the planes and stuff and if they're searching for somebody that's the last thing you want to be responsible for is that kind of thing you, you said it gary it's a catch-22 it's beautiful i mean the yeah. video the stuff we saw from the cathedral lake are, are, are views that we would never get on a hike 
But I also understand, you know, you, when you get away, you want to get away from the city and the life and having something buzz a little bit, even if it's a little bit, can be distracting. But it's, it's again, it's nice to go home and watch those videos and see that footage. But I can see it. You know, I think you're right. It's right down the middle. It's either you're, you're for or against. Nobody's like, nah, I don't care. Either right. you, you love the piece or you want the, the, the well, memories. And, and so, we, you know, just to give kind of maybe a numbers view, we met the one woman who hated it. We met four or five people who are still my friends. Right. Who asked me to send them that footage and shake footage of them? Yes, Facebook friends. Yes, making Facebook friends in the wilderness with a drone. It's all about social. No oh, thought that. I mean, seriously, when you did the AT years ago, who would have thought that social that there would be a Facebook and that you could make friends? Yeah, that was a, definitely a game changer. So let, let's transition to you, Mister Off Camera here. Uh, <laughs> we'll call you Cardiac, but I'm called Cardiac Steve because you were there the the day that you introduced me to hiking. I mean, I had hiked before and hiked some mountain or local trails but never really understood or appreciated the outdoors until we went to Deer Valley in Utah. M mind you, it was literally right off the plane where I went and bought clothes and hiking boots. Or right up to you. Cause you didn't flash a, you didn't. I, I didn't have anything to wear. We literally stopped at an outlet. I bought stuff, changed in the parking lot, and we we're hiking Deer Valley. And by the time we got to the trailhead, I think we were looking for defibrillators, and thus my name, <laughs> Cardiac. That's Unfortunately, getting the 11,000 plus feet and coming you know, right off a plane from Dallas, I think uh, pretty much introduced to me as being way out of shape, but also <laughs> seeing how enjoyable it was for you and Tony who were with us um, gave me the passion to where from then on, I would try to get a hike in all my trips, whether business or personal, from the uh, Multnomah Falls in Oregon to hiking trails in Austin. And so that, that's kind of what led Gary and I to, to doing Machu Picchu. As we talked about earlier, the trip from two years ago, we've gone to Colorado, we've done 14 years. And we've done all this stuff. And so this was our first foray outside of the U.S. And Machu Picchu was on the bucket list. You've come a long way since uh, when you got dubbed your trail name Cardiac. Well I'm done. still here, so uh, that's a good point. <laughs> We're going to talk about fitness in terms of Machu Picchu, too. So um, maybe just to start, uh, to, to get into the Machu Picchu uh, part of the trail cat or the podcast here, um, how about some true and false questions and see how, how knowledgeable you guys are post- Trip. You guys did your trip in the summer, right? We did it at the end of July. July 31st to August 1st. Yeah. Or July, sorry, July 28th. July 28th. It was my wife's birthday that we took off. Okay. And we got back on August 1st. August 2nd we got back. This is when we got back to the U.S. Oh, right. August 2nd. Yeah. 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 Which in Peru is their... Um... July 28th, ironically, is the day of independence for Peru. Yes. And we learned that, which was interesting. It was their July 4th. It's July 28th. So Peru Independence Day was the day of our beginning hike. And the first day of our hike, we went to this small village where we, we set up our camping outside and we walked up and we got to see them celebrating. And um, there was fireworks and stuff. And it was, it was very interesting. It was, a cool, I mean, it was a cool time to go. Well, help me with my geography, though. They're south of the equator, right? Yeah. Yes. So their Earth. seasons are opposite ours? Yes. Except Peru is very temperate in the fact that it's mountainous. So a lot of the temperatures that, that we were feeling, like at 14,000 feet, I think it got down to 28 degrees that night, they said. Yeah, I mean, the first night was the best. It was yeah. the most comfortable I was. The second night, we oh, froze to death. I could not have trapped warmer. And we were in, what, what were those sleeping bags called? I mean, basically, we were yeah, in mummy bags. Yeah, they were mummy bags to keep warm. The third night, it was like a Viet Cong sweat box for those, <laughs> for those vets out there. It was so hot. It was, yeah. And I, you, you know, all we had were mummy bags. So, I mean, you're just sitting in your tent, basically yeah. laying on top of the mummy bag, hot and very uncomfortable, knowing that we had to get up at 3 a.m. in the morning that day. So there wasn't much rest. But we'll get to that later on. Um, but, yeah, we can start with the true and false. Theory. Well, we'll do that. Like, just some quick background for the, for the listeners. So, um, Machu Picchu is in Peru. It's near the uh, town of Cusco. Is that right? Yeah, she Cusco, started out in Cusco. Which, yeah. how far is Cusco from Peru? A couple hours. I mean, Cusco's in Peru. Yeah. But yeah. Cusco yeah. From, Excuse from, me. from Machu Picchu, Machu Picchu, it's a couple hours. It was at least two, two it was hours. Like a, yeah, it was like an hour and a half, two-hour drive on a bus to the start. Of the trail, and then once you're done with the trail, and you it was a four hour tour back between train and bus. Well, yeah, you you end Machu Picchu is actually in the town called Aguas Calientes, which is um, right down at the base. Hot water, I think so. I don't know. I'm, I'm working on my Spanish or something. It's, yeah, it's yeah. something like that. But it, it's 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 a town that that after learning about it and, and things of that sort, it's a town that has exploded, but only in terms of population. They have zero infrastructure whatsoever at the town. 
So, and is that because of tourism? That yeah, it's expired? tourism yeah. in Peru is is what the lifeblood of Peru is. So you you end at this place, and then you've got to take a train or a bus back to Cusco. And so what Scott said was the four hour ride. It was two yeah. hours on a train and two hours on yeah, you know, like a van that we had to drive back. And this was the last day, no shower for it four was days, tough. exhausted. <laughs> it was um, the tough. train was awesome. Uh, we had a nice glass train. They 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 served up. It was a fashion snack. show on the train. Yeah, yeah fashion show. We <laughs> got good views. But you you haven't slept in the night. The last night of the trip, and I, as I'm jumping ahead, you you only get a couple hours. Yeah. Because they you want to get to the gate to see those sunrise. Oh, okay. At the gate. Sunrise. Yeah. Save and, all that because we're going to talk specifically about the trail. Okay. Uh, before we do true or false, just a couple things quickly for the listeners. So Machu Picchu is apparently built some somewhere between 1450 and uh, 1460. This is what my research tells me. Honestly. Unless you want to challenge that. Well, they don't know. And this is what you learn when you do research on Machu Picchu is everything about Machu Picchu is a guess. It's an educated guess by people who are just guessing about things. Okay. Because what happened was when the Spanish came in, they, they destroyed everything. And the Incas didn't have a written language, so there was no nothing recorded. Right. So um, Hiram Bickham, which is the guy that, that discovered it a few hundred years ago, he basically well, it was in the, Yeah, it was in the early 1900s. Yeah, somewhere around yeah, there. It was, a few hundred. It, was only, it was only a little over 100 yeah. years ago. And, and, 1911. And he found it. And there weren't people living there. There's nobody. The, the whole thing was wiped out. So the Incas have, have very little do- documented about what this was. The, the story is when the Spaniards came, they tried to take horses up the Inca Trail. And the horses died, obviously. But the, the mosquitoes got horses in, in, what was it, smallpox. Basically called smallpox. And wait, you, wait, sit- you guys got to stop because these are all my true and false questions. Sorry. Oh, all right. All right. Are you ready? Right. Yes. Yeah, We're going to go, go straight into true and yeah. false. You're killing me here. Yeah. <laughs> jump in the gun. You're the one who jumped the gun. We were ready for true and false 10 minutes ago. All right, here we go. True or false? Machu Picchu is known as the lost city of the Incas. Oh, true. True. False! <laughs> what? Yes, it's actually Vilcabamba is the true lost city of the Incas. Did we see that? I don't even know. Are you sure you guys being bit? I, 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 I would like to, to audit your questions. <laughs> are you ready? We have for, pictures of proof. Are you, ready, are you ready for another? Yeah, yeah fire that, I gotta tell you, I've been playing HQ Live on the iPhone. That's a tough trivia I got question. Eight in a row last night. Eight's it. good. I heard five is your highest. Five is my highest. Yeah. So your true false questions. We're probably not going to do that good based on the beginning of this. Well, you're zero for one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Machu Picchu was inhabited for around 80 years, but was abandoned when most of its inhabitants died from smallpox induced by travelers that came in contact with Spanish conquistadors and other parts of the empire. I'm going to say true, but really the horses being killed and, and that stuff. So I think it's true. I would say it's true, but it's a guess. So I would then say false. Wow. So I might be wow. My I'm man right, nailed right. that one. It's <laughs> false because it's plausible, but it's not been proven. Right. I think everything is that way. The world's flat. I, that. I know there's some arguments out there. People are saying it's flat. Isn't that now like the new trending thing? Uh, so there's some arguments that way too. But all right. Wow. So, so uh, Gary's one for one. I'm going to give you one, one for two. two. Holy one for crap. Two. One for two. All right. The next question. True and false. guy went true and false on that. You're giving him credit. <laughs> I'm going to say true and false, Steve, in your next question. I would like to get back in the game. <laughs> the Spanish plundered Machu Picchu for gold. True or oh, false? True. I don't think so. I think it was for land. I'm going to go false. <laughs> I don't think it was gold. Cardiac's correct. False. What? The yeah. Spanish never actually found Machu Picchu. They You're never right. actually You're found right. it. Okay. Right. You're right. You're right. Wow. So now we got we got a tie right now. Right. 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 That you guys are both one and two. Is Hiram Bickham found it? Yeah. Three and zero. Oh. Um, I think that's his name. Yeah, well, it's Hiram Bingham. Yeah. 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 The next question. The evidence suggests that the Germans were the first people outside of South America to explore Machu Picchu. I believe that's false. Yeah, the Germans false. drink too much beer to have made it there. <laughs> I'm going to say false. <laughs> Incorrect. Okay, you guys, what, are you what, sure what German, you've actually been there? German, I can tell you this. They don't have pretzels. There's no way the Germans were there. <laughs> what German showed up there is what I want to know. It's all that's right. unbelievable. They actually think that two different Germans uh, were there before your boy Hiram that went there. Well, the uh, if you just said Spaniards or English or French, the Germans? I mean, seriously, I, I don't know. The Germans are everywhere. They're the, like the world travelers. Okay, Adolf, I don't think that's necessarily the case. <laughs> I, what I'm trying to focus on, 
is your question, and I'm gonna I'm definitely asking for an audience. I gotta tell you, I, I these are pretty hard. Uh, all right, right. I, I, well, you guys are one for four. I just want uh, to tell you that right now. Fire, is there I, I'm starting to doubt that you actually went to Maju. Crew is four letters. I know true boss when you spell it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was expecting. <laughs> I, I just want to give you that Hiram Bingham, who you had referenced earlier, yes. um, was the person that actually gets credit for really, I don't know if you want to give him credit for this, but he's the one that brought international attention to Machu Picchu. Yes. Right. He was the he guy a that there was led there by that lived there. Yes. He found two families in, in, in Machu Picchu when we were there. Apparently a local farmer led him to the site. He was looking for the old Inca capital. Yes. And uh, he actually gets credit for the... And he's an American. Again, I don't, know, American, right? I, don't want to, I don't know if you want to give him credit for it because, uh, you know, now it's overrun with tourists, but he's the guy that gets credit for making it an international site. Right. Right, but, but you know they don't allow. They obviously don't allow drones or any stuff. There isn't, and an, an, I don't think there's any airplanes or helicopters. There's nothing that goes over it, which is fascinating because the way they built Machu Picchu is it's all based on astrology, a lot of it, and so they don't allow any airplanes. Like when we were there, I kept looking up. There was no airplane. You would think just an airplane over the distance would go, but that's why they never found it. You think about all these years, and you think about the technology. We, I mean, it took even in the early 1900s to discover Machu Picchu. They didn't have, you would think we'd be able to fly planes over it or they would have unbelievable video of it. Well, it's supposedly the trails got all overgrown that went there. And well, and they're still fine. There's only 30% of the trails visible now. Right. So think about it. 70% is just been, needs think to still be uncovered. Well, you've teed me up perfectly for my next question. Oh, God. And that is, in the late 1900s, the Peruvian government granted concessions to allow construction of a cable car and luxury hotel, including a tourist complex, with boutiques and restaurants in a bridge to the site. True or false? False. That's true. Because, they. I mean, think about it. They, they definitely have it stuff there. Oh, cardiac! It's Wait, that one right! Too much, you beat you? They yeah. actually approved it. They did approve it. But they haven't built it. Well, there was a huge backlash. Uh, well, no, they, they have a luxury hotel down where we went down when we took the bus down to Machu Picchu City. Is there a luxury hotel? I'm sorry, not Machu Picchu City. No, I was in coming. Machu Picchu. There's a luxury hotel. Jeff was going to give us it. It was 1200 bucks. a night. Oh, that's right. Right there, oh. they had the hotel at, right outside Machu Picchu. And right when we picked up the bus, I was like, there's, there's a, a hotel, hotel there? That's oh, hotel. that's right. Yeah. Dude, that was luxury? Yeah, it's it's $1,200 a night. Oh, my God. Because Jeff was like, if I stay there, I'll go. Like, they can bus up. To your point, Steve, and I believe you'll ask this question later on. It is pretty incredible as you're in the jungles of Peru doing this hike for four days, and when you come out, people are starting to walk towards you. Oh, we're going to talk about that. Yeah, they're walking up. We're definitely going to talk about uh, that. That, that, that. Save that because that's not. And, my and by the way, thing, uh, by the way, they're walking up to what's called I think the gates. What was it? Sun gate. Sun, Sun gate. gate. So the, the bus goes right to Machu Picchu. Let's just go ahead and get it out now because we're talking about it. But that was one of my lists. I mean, that had to be completely deflating because you guys spent four days. That was I, I was I, okay. So here's my experience, and then the, I we walked to the Sun Gate. I had researched this thing. That was the place that I wanted to go see the sunrise. It was great. They only allow 500 people per day on the Inca Trail, so there were 500 people up there. Um, kind of doing time lapses and pictures, and and, and we were all dirty. And not all, not all at the same time. Some started at three and right. four and one. So you're at your hiking. Everybody's hiking at different times. So yeah, I would say there's probably a hundred people right. up there when we were there. Yeah, watching the sunrises. Yeah. The then the second, buses roll in. Well, no, no the that's second we leave, that's it's it. about a mile and a half. Hike. Yeah. So we, so the closest you can get is a mile away. So there's no, no, no the, bus, sun, the, the buses sun go. The buses go to Machu Picchu. The sun gate is up on this mountain overlooking oh, Machu Picchu. I got you. So the visual is awesome. Oh, I see. That's where everybody gets their picture. That's where you the get the picture yeah, of you. And that's the one where you got your arm spread. It's well, like, no, 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 that's, that's down. That's down in Machu yeah, Picchu. Yeah, we were in Machu. Picchu. They, there's pictures of us above where you look down. And you're like, oh, that's little Machu Picchu because you're above it on this mountain. Okay. And it's a mile and a half hike, which was fascinating because number one, it was hot that day. As Gary and I will talk later when we talk about the tour that we had to take of Machu Picchu, but. People are walking up, and they don't even have any camelbacks, no water. They just took a bus up and figured out, walk a mile and a half up. But it's pretty steep, mile and a half up in that, so that's three miles around the trip, and they didn't even have water. And so what you see, what you see as you're walking down from the Sun Gate to Machu Picchu in the mile and a half is the reason that Disney outlawed selfie sticks. Because it's basically everybody in their outlet gear wear <laughs> that they bought at the local outlet mall. With a cell, their phone on a selfie stick with a Bluetooth remote taking selfies of Machu Picchu. And here we are walking down 
filthy. All right. And and we haven't had a shower. We haven't had a bath. We're in the same boat, except we for Gary. Have... Gary. Gary's the only one out of everyone that changed every day. The rest of us are wearing exactly what we started. <laughs> I did. I did have an apricot. We had I had Merlot or Merino wow. stuff all over. Yeah, it was. It was. It, you know, it, it was definitely deflating to walk in there and, and then just be crowded by these people with selfie sticks. Now, you know, I had selfie sticks too, but I kind of felt like, okay, I'm getting gypped of my experience because I just did four days of grueling hiking and, and it was worth it. And these people are taking a bus there. They're taking a bus. And I'll so, tell you, I did not research any of that. So the only thing I researched on was A, was I going to survive the hike, right? <laughs> what does that take? What's training like? What's eating like? All of the training that went into, like, the hike I was excited about because what we saw that those people who took the train to Machu Picchu didn't see were other Inca sites. Yeah, yeah, the real, the real program. Yeah, you're real. You're in the jungles. You're seeing the forts. You're going to other places. Now, Machu Picchu is the creme of the creme. It's the Taj Mahal. But you get to see other Inca sites along the way. And, and the memories you have with the people you're with, it just they're, they're just something special about that. And to Gary, it does cheapen a little bit when you get there, and it's like you just walked into a Walmart at the end with all these people walking around. Yeah, well, yeah, I had that experience. Uh, have you guys ever been to Mount Washington in New Hampshire? No. Same thing. Like, you know, it's taken me days to get to <laughs> Mount Washington. You finally come to the top of the peak, and there's these people coming up in a car, right? Well, that's like Pikes Peak, yeah. right? Like, so yeah, Pikes Peak, yeah. right. you can drive up. Yeah. And, uh, and Pikes Peak something that Gary and I tried to hike this year, but unfortunately, due to weather, we couldn't do it. But... It, um, but yeah, you kind of are like, wow, oh, these guys are all laying on their car and we just busted our butt going up the hill. <laughs> well, yeah. So we're going to talk a lot more about the trail in a second. Let me give you the final true-false question. Okay. <laughs> Probably the most interesting. True-false. Both. <laughs> that could be true. <laughs> New tourism is a recent trend. To the dismay of Peruvian officials, by the way. In several incidents, tourists were detained for posing for nude pictures or streaking across oh, the site. Oh, nude stuff. I thought you were saying nude. Uh, nude? I wouldn't know, but but Scott went nude. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I thought it was a, I thought it was a special experience, but it sounds like other people have had that experience. So I uh, I'm gonna assume it's true because it's so wild out there. I don't know. I'm gonna say it's true. But the one thing that was happening when Gary and I were there was they were protesting, and they were protesting an airport being built near Machu Picchu, and they weren't protesting necessarily for the airport. They were protesting, I think, for the money and the jobs and stuff that it would bring. So they were actually in favor of. No, well, they it was they they sort of wanted to unionize and they wanted they 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 wanted to be against it unless they got jobs and they got something out of it because I think it was going to be a private airport and stuff. So, but there was huge protests, and that was in Cusco that we saw that. I, I, I did read that they banned helicopters, so you guys didn't see helicopters. No, so I didn't even see airplanes. Gotcha. And obviously, no drones. Yeah. Gary flew his drone in Cusco, and uh, it was nerve wracking. I think because Cus well, Cus yeah. Cus I shouldn't have been as nervous as I was finding out later and stuff, but um, Cusco and, and Lima, I flew the drone. Well, and that you brought it through, and we had to go through Bogota, Colombia on the way there. Yeah. So you, you have this drone on you, and now you're going to go this country. <laughs> so it was it may or may not be involved I mean, in the drone. Gary reading all the fines and all the stuff, and then he's going to leave for the airport early to fight. I, I can talk about that that yeah, later, but... But no, I you guys look good on camera, though. I'll be honest. Both you look, look marvelous. Both of you look thinner. <laughs> I, I look over here like, God, they put weight on. Then I look at the camera, and you're like thin. So it's, it's nuts. <laughs> that, that voice is coming from the fat guy over there off camera. That's right. <laughs> well, you may have seen a roll or two lean in, but yeah. <laughs> so before we talk specifically about the uh, the hike to Machu Picchu, just just a couple uh, first impressions. Going to come out swinging with some big questions here. Um, the thing that made you laugh hardest on the trip. I feel like there was something. There was a story. A lot of times, you know, we'd sit around the, the dinner. I, I will tell you, I, it was probably inappropriate jokes that we did, but one night we were sitting around the table and all that stuff, and, and I was joking about to William about his relationships with different hikers over the years and stuff. You know, they, they, you know he would tell us unbelievable stories. It was great. Now, he was your guy. Yeah, our guy. And by the way, I think one of the questions, if you haven't asked, you will, and that's everybody has to have a guy. Yeah, that it was on very, my list. So there's two, there's three checkpoints that I remember going to. Right off the bat on the on the thing, we have to go and show them our passport and do all that. Then we hike up, we sleep. The second day, right before we go up this mountain, 4,000 feet straight up, which was by far the toughest day and in one in which I was far in the back. But it absolutely was the greatest feeling once we got to the top. We had to check in right before we go. And they basically, they time you to make sure they know. Because as Gary said, there's 500 people on the trail. So it's their way, I think, of checking it. And then the last time we checked in was the morning of the last day, at like 2 or 3.30, 2.30 or 3 in the morning, right before we go to the gates. 
Well, that's interesting. I had no idea that you were getting up in the basically the middle of the night too. Well, every day we got up, we got up around six in the morning. We go to bed about eight at night and get up at six in the morning. And one of the things that Gary and I were just talking about it, that they give us is coca tea. Now, when we flew into Peru, we flew in and we were exhausted. It was overnight. We got to our hotel and they offered us this coca tea. Do you want some hot tea? They're like, it'll make you feel really good. So we didn't know what they made cocaine. Out it of? is. It's five yes. percent cocaine. <laughs> we believe blast. all of us yes. would have failed drug tests coming back because of this. <laughs> Gary, was it Gary or was it was you or Matt that bought a bag of it? I bought a bag of it. Yeah. And then you found it, out, and you put it in your lid. But then you found out you couldn't bring it back, so we gave you it to somebody. It, yeah. it was a bag. There were leaves. They were just leaves. They were coca leaves. So you're thinking, oh, just, uh, you know, it's like tobacco, right? well, you know. But it was. It really like cleared you up and made you. And they they do it. They said, don't drink it at night because it would wire you up. So every morning, they would knock on our tents when they would wake us up. And they'd give us this hot water in a little bucket to wash our face, brush our teeth. Because later on, we saw them washing their feet. <laughs> uh, which is not a really good thing. There, there is, that was, that was okay. one, you're serious? You're not getting serious. Oh, oh, dead serious. Dead serious. Yeah. So, so wait, that's after you used it to brush your teeth? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so, I mean, it was... Yeah. As most of your listeners understand, <laughs> you guys are outdoors. Yeah. You, you're, you're talking about two really white collar germaphobes that were <laughs> yeah. on this hike watching our tour guide the first day peek dead into a creek in which some people take to use filtered water <laughs> i mean he's literally just peeing right into the creek which uh, we didn't need to see and then two they give us those buckets of warm water and then watching them that night fill it up and wash their feet into it and then that next morning knowing that those were what we brushed our teeth in was not a good feeling but then the warm coca tea was great. Every morning you'd wake up, you'd take that. It would definitely fire you up. There was no coffee. So it was the hot coca tea that got us going. So it was a good feeling. Yeah. We had it at the hotel. And, and I tell you what made me laugh the hardest, and you left this out, but, but it, it's kind of a theme of the trail was um, the first day you hike from the start of the Inca Trail, you, you go over this little walk bridge, and then you're hiking to lunch. And it's about, I think, 12 or 1 o'clock in the afternoon by the time you get lunch. It's a little bit later. And because um, you've been going since five in the morning, five in the morning from when they picked us up and drove us, right. we didn't really start hiking until about ten. Right, and it's about an eight mile, a little over an eight mile hike the first day. So right. at, four, at the four mile mark, you go and get lunch. And you get lunch, and, and, and they set it up, and it's very nice. And I, I remember one of the things that that sticks out in my memory is we're sitting there eating, and and, and it's a very gourmet meal. They they make you handmade guacamole. Um, there's some chicken and rice that they have. Some some, some nice vegetables. Scott eats none of it. But I remember we we get in the tent. <laughs> I got that's yeah. on my list to ask you about, by the way. <laughs> but he eats none of it. And, and and what was interesting was we're sitting in the tent and I remember just, God, this is great. And and Scott walks in with just this like white, pale face and just the look of horror on his face. And and, and I remember saying to Matt, Well, what the hell's wrong with Scott? And then Scott goes, do not go to the bathroom down there. And I said, what, what, is, what is that? He goes, it looks like a murder happened in the bathroom. It was bathroom. unbelievable. I, yeah. and, and by the way, the best part was, so you have this unpaid toilet where you, you don't have to pay to get in. It was, a free, by, it was a free app. Right. Run by the government. That's where. Like you'd have the AT. Wouldn't that's, yeah, yeah. that's where it looks like a Colombian style massacre I mean, happened. There is. I don't know if I can swear on this. Yeah, absolutely. There, well, there's yeah. feces everywhere. Like a monkey had gone yes. and taken piles of feces <laughs> and thrown it, it spread it on the wall. It looked to like the point where you walk in, and I'm like, just, so I'm like I, and I'll be, I'll be frank on this. Yeah. I did not go number two. Yeah. I know that may be too much information for well, your listeners, but I didn't really eat anything except like garlic bread, so that helped. And what was, what was interesting about that first day is I remember eating this gourmet meal and knowing that the impending doom was going to need to happen. And Scott telling me that there was a murder happening. It was so place. bad. I, so I remember. How bad did it I remember. Smell? Well, I remember getting up. It was and, just on the roof, on the walls. Like I yeah. walked in. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm just like, do I just pee? And I, get me out of here. And there was another place you could pay. Right. It, it was. Like, it was like a setup. And right? that was that. Like, was, let's just destroy this. We'll just throw <laughs> shit everywhere. That was the thing was, and the appetizer was, was guacamole. Oh. So I ate the guacamole, and then I knew when he said this has happened. I said, "There's about 300 other people eating lunch, and this." This place is only going to get worse. So let me get up and create that impending doom right now. So I get up and I go and I find this pay toilet. It's like 10 solace or something. It was like $1 American. Yeah, oh, no, maybe 30 cents American. Yeah, and a woman hands you three strips of toilet paper. Like three I don't squares. know anybody who can do the, like their three number squares. two with three squares of toilet paper. Seriously, yeah. that's it. And that's She's like, it. Peels it off. And what's yeah. funny is I remember talking to Matt. 
And and Matt goes, I said, I'm going now Matt just to get it out of the way. Yeah, those, yeah. Are the, those are the four. So Matt says, I'm, I'm going to wait until we have our thing, and then I'll go. So I go to the pay toilet, put it in, and, and get the lady the money, and, and, and I get everything done, come back. We get done with the meal, and I remember Matt gets up, and he goes, time to go read the paper or something. And then he, he takes his stroll. He comes back with the same white face that Scott had. <laughs> and I said, what the, I said, what the hell happened? And he oh, goes, he didn't pay? Well, no. and, and, and he goes, the woman took her lunch like an hour ago, and nobody can find her, so it's locked up. So the only option was the murder toilet. Oh, <laughs> yeah. they had locked up, but when I paid, she would taken a break. And by the way, oh. when I say toilet, the pay had a toilet. How clean was the pay? It was pretty clean. I, I would say it was like a restroom in the U.S., which is, yeah, you yeah, know, okay. like a gas station. Do, doable, kind of thing. yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. The, the, the most of the free toilets are not even toilets. They're just a hole in the ground kind of thing. Yeah. So what we found out, William told us on the second day there was the last uh, pay toilet, and that's what you want to use. Yeah. Because when we got to, like, day three and, and just – the toilet situation. There is a picture, and unfortunately, your listeners can look, but that is a clean bathroom. Yeah. Oh, but there is, you're not, I mean, that's me standing over it, and you pee in that hole. For the people dropping a deuce here, <laughs> yeah, that is the hole. So, <laughs> and by the way, that's that should the be the garbage. cover photo. Yeah. They don't allow you to flush any toilet, so you wipe your ass and throw in the garbage can. <laughs> so, yeah. you're basically peeing next to a garbage can full of feces for and all that even, matter. What's even worse is no 99% no of the people. And guys and girls, you just crouch over yeah. this thing and drop a couple logs. And then, I don't know how you get them in the hole. Is there a flush system there? No. No, there's no, no, flush, no flush system. There's no water. And you would wipe with the three toilets. Yeah, were, <laughs> I, I had already packed my own toilet. three squares. You would throw it in the garbage <laughs> can. You would throw it in the garbage can. can. Oh, this wow. is a clean one. Now, take this picture, which yeah. obviously your, I'll try I'll to describe to your listeners, <laughs> and just cover the picture. Just explode diarrhea all yeah. over it. And that is what we're what, that's by what way, we're even if you, even There was... Crap on ceilings and on walls and stuff. I don't know how you do that, but I can I I was so excited the first day that I went with one of these things in the ground, I hit a bullseye. <laughs> and it was like one of two times that I went, each time I hit a bullseye. But all I was thinking is, there's no way in the world coming from a western toilet to one of these that people are hitting bullseyes. I'm showing them a picture, and this is a picture of our first night, the first night site. And oh, that is the bathroom. That's a bathroom. So oh, it quick. was horrible. So this was I, I was the prettiest sight, but that is the bathroom. Yeah. So yeah. you would have to wear a headlamp, walk up the hill. <laughs> and by the way, to to kill any smell, they overloaded every sense yeah. ever. I mean they just threw it up in potpourri. Like yeah. you walked in there and died from toxins <laughs> where they tried to make it smell better, but it was brutal. <laughs> it was horrible. Um, but it was we a, need to put that picture on the website. Yeah, it was a beautiful oh, website. Wow, beautiful. Like, that's what we woke up to in the morning. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we'd definitely get these pictures to you. But it was it was an amazing um, experience. But like Gary was talking about the first day. And the first day was the – I think the way they said it was the first day was the easiest of the hike. The second day was the hardest. The third day was the second hardest. And then the fourth day. So if you had to rate the days, the fourth day was the shortest. Um, but it was the hardest because it was no, the no, steepest. No, no. Okay. The second day was the, the, the steepest, the hardest. Yeah. It was a long – the third day was the longest hike. So it wasn't as hard as it was long. The second day was longer than the first and literally 4,000 feet straight up. Matt, how many how many miles were we talking? You're doing four thousand feet over how far? We did well, twenty seven miles over yeah. four days, with the last day being about three miles. So you average about eight miles a day for the first three days. Okay. Um, and I think it was, and so it was like eight, more like eight, ten, and six. Right? Sorry, eight, six, and ten, because it was only six miles a day that we went four thousand feet straight up. But that's a pretty good beat. Well, and I got to tell you, part of my training was doing two hundred flights of stairs a day. And that's stairs. what I would say is the best to do. <laughs> well, yeah, I didn't have any problem going up. Um, going up, I was fine. I mean, he said I was like, you know. Yeah, he was a rocket going up, and I was a rocket going down. I yeah. just talked and rolled. I'm yeah. like, you, yeah. man. Going down, I had a problem because of my knee situation. But it, it, it was kind of tough going down for me. And, and the third day was rather tough because it was long. And the problem on the third day is you have no level footing whatsoever. You're on cobblestones or you're on dirt trails where you're kind of rolling ankles. And, and you're on ledges. And if you're yes. afraid of heights, yes. you're looking down. Now, I'm not afraid of heights, but there was nothing. Like, our tour guide said, make sure if you have any t- locals walk by you, you go to the mountainside. Yes. Don't go to the edge side. 
We don't need any accidents. I'm I was talking to what so Matt and Virginia were with Gary and I. I was walking with Matt and I'm talking to him and he goes, Look out, and I almost walked off the ledge. Mm-hmm. And I, unfortunately, in all my pictures, I could not find a picture that would do justice the drop. Now, what that kind of drop? drop? Like how what sort of feet? Drop I mean, you're talking I mean it, it was six thousand. Yeah, significant 6, feet at different times. But because of jungle buildup, like you fall, you would be falling through Sticker bushes, stuff, yeah, stuff, yeah. stuff that had grown on the side of the mountain, right. but there was nothing to hold you, right? Yeah, you would yeah, just yeah. be, you know, it was a drop down. So the picture really couldn't show um, Again, what we felt. If we so, had a drone. Yeah, you could get it. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the 4,000 feet, are you going up most of the time with it these is, little drops? It's or? a straight up. So when you're talking about coming down, it's after you climb Machu Picchu. No. So okay. do you get to Machu Picchu in a valley. So, so the first uh, day you so. hike, you hike to a, a little town and, and it's kind of nice. Um, you know, again, throughout the trail, there's no running water. There's no kind of services or anything. But, but you people, are going through small towns. But people do live here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And right. when I'm talking small towns, I'm talking 40 or 50 people live in these places. And they serve the hikers that come on this community. So, so are they the ones actually these, cooking for you? Or do the guys cook? No, the guy, we have porters. Okay. So we had, I think, nine porters, uh, nine staff or four of us. Or six of us, six of us. So it's not like the townspeople are feeding you and making money off of it. The guys no. are the ones that are doing it. No, that. but they okay. they have Snickers bars and things of that sort. And there's some churches. This gives you. Way. I'm uh-huh. showing him basically the mountain. Height. Yeah. So we yeah. started here. So it's a pretty flat, and then literally the second day is straight up, and then you go down into this valley and camp, and then the third day is all the way down to here. So, so we'll we'll, we'll put these on Facebook for the listeners. It, it's like a bell curve, though. It's essentially a. You peak out, and then you kind of come down. Yeah. But you're only coming down that. But it, it is literally a straight up 4,000 feet elevation of difference. Yeah. Yeah, and again, my suggestion is if anybody's ever going to do this hike, if you do 200 flights of stairs on the Stairmaster, and I did it for, the, I think, the month before the trip, I was already a runner. So I was n- used to running like three to five miles, no problem. But I wasn't used to kind of going up. And, and that Stairmaster, I think... Because I was the only one of the group that did the Stairmaster, and I was so far out from, in front of everyone. Well, Matt did it too. Matt, Matt who went on and had never really hiked anything right. other than maybe a local hiking trail. He had never been a hiker. He's he third grade. He was the youngest guy on the trip, but he asked me what he should do, and he went to, he went to his gym every day, and he got up to about 120 flights a day on the Stairmaster. Mm-hmm. I said that because of the unevenness. The toughest thing, really, and Gary said it, is because... They're all handmade stairs, mm-hmm. and so I think if you, I think all of our stairs and all of our houses are eight-inch steps. And I think wasn't it you, Gary, that told me about that study they did? Yeah, it's it's when you when you climb steps, you get muscle memory. And and what this one study did was they they did one step that was nine inches, and and everybody tripped. <laughs> everybody tripped. And so so just one, yeah, nobody could nobody could make it up the stairs without tripping. And to your and point, handmade, handmade is... They're all different yeah, levels. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there was three different stones. times yeah, I right. almost ate it. Gary wanted to take a picture one time. We were going down the that steep area. I went to turn. My second time laughing. <laughs> if I did not have poles, I would not be here sitting. <laughs> I mean, so that dumb. you would have heard, you could hear everybody, uh, like, gasp that I was done. <laughs> Virginia, I reached back yeah, my pole. Hey, I told him. Virginia, Virginia screamed at me then. And, and there was another time where we were, um, I was looking over the edge of something, and I remember Scott and Virginia got nervous because it looked like the dirt on the edge of it was going to give out because I was so close to the edge. And I'm kind of leaning over, and they started screaming at me. And I turned around to see them, and I got dizzy because I'm scared. Of, I'm afraid of heights. And so they, I almost got fought, fell off there, too. So you guys have views most of the time you're hiking. I mean, it sounds like you're not in the canopy. I mean, you have views. No, you have views the entire time. It, it is gorgeous. You, yeah. I mean, the, the third or really, the only time we really didn't, oh, we had to use the fourth day. The third day, there was maybe a period where you're just going through, like, woods. Yeah. But, but not it's, much. It's, Most yeah, of it's, it's, I would say 98% of the time you have, it's pr- the prettiest country I've ever been to. Now, um, we, we rented everything. I know you talk about what we got and the porters and what they're carrying. The, the first day we slept on grass. It was the most comfortable, best night's sleep. The next two days we slept on rock, which was a killer. We had inflatable mattresses, and that was fine from the sleeping. But when you had to get up to pee, and knowing you for a shooter, <laughs> every ten minutes, like yeah, getting out of the tent, it is all rock. So if you don't stand up immediately and you put your knee down, it's gravel. So yeah. it's all rock and gravel. So it, it, I mean, it hurt a little bit. You get straightened up just going out to pee, and then if you're barefoot, you're hurting walking on rocks. So, so let's talk about the campsites a little bit. So you're not actually camping in the towns. No, no. They're like no. designated campsites? Yeah. We yeah. watched them kill a chicken the first day. So it really got interesting. So when Gary talked about all the food, 
you know, as we're eating and everybody's having it, and they're bringing this. Really, I mean, I even tried some of the some of the meat one time. It was good. Um, we oh, we ate alpaca. So I, I'm all yeah. over the place here. But when we got to Peru, we went out for a couple of dinners, and Matt was by far the most adventurous out of all of us eating. And yeah. he really wanted to eat guinea pig, which is the delicacy of Peru. Mm. So you could get guinea pig in most restaurants. Thankfully, you could also get pizza. So it was a win-win for all of us. Um, I but, can't believe you found pizza. That yeah. Easily. So, but I ate alpaca the first night. We tried it. We I had, have video of it. Yeah, I have video. He says it's gamey. Yeah, it was a little chewy, but but um, um, we did that. But now, now uh, going back to the campsite, they would make some. They would make decent food, I guess, for those that ate yeah, it. Decent. It was incredible food that they. We consider they set up a kitchen on spot. But then one of the guys that we were with, um, that we had just met on the tour, asked, "Where, where? You know, I don't see you with coolers. Like, what are you? Where are you storing the meat? I saw you kill the chicken. The first morning they killed the chicken, so we knew the chicken was fresh, right? Uh, but we didn't know where you stored the meat. And they're like, oh, what we do is we, we have meat in the bags, and we keep meat in bags in the river, and it's all snow melt, so the water's cold, it yeah. keeps the meat cold. So they would just have these places where they would just drop in meat in the river, and they would cook it. Nobody got nobody got sick at all yeah. from the food, which, I, I mean, I had garlic bread. The last night is a special treat. They made me a pizza. And <laughs> on the trail? Yeah. On the trail. How they bake? I, I don't know. I don't. They, well, they had cheese and they had bread. The garlic bread. They made me garlic bread every night. So it was like garlic bread and they put mozzarella and, and sauce they, on there. They, yeah, they, I think they chopped up the tomatoes and actually made you sauce. Because, well, wasn't that the one? They put tomatoes on it. He's like, no, 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 no. I don't like tomatoes. Yeah, I, I just like the sauce. Well, that was at the restaurant. <laughs> the restaurant we had at the restaurant. So, yeah, I, no, it was. It was the, so are they cooking over an open fire or they have like little stoves that they. Uh, uh, they have propane. Mm -hmm. so, so these guys, and I had video of me trying to carry one of the packs. The porters carry. Anywhere between 60 and 80 pound packs. Wow. Um, I've got a picture of it, Gary. Yeah, they're carrying our tents. And you said you had nine You had nine porters for your group. Now, how many were in your group? There were four Six. with you specifically, and then you had two others. We had two others from Texas. They were Texas. And, and like the um, people you met on the trail, nationality. There's us eating food in the tent. We can give you all these pictures, and you can post them to your Facebook page. But this is us eating in the tent. So that's Virginia. That's William our tour guide. That's Matt, Gary. Um, that's a big Jeff. tent. Much bigger than that. Oh, uh, they have good. I mean, they set up an eating tent for you. Yeah. Here it is on the outside. Wow, and they, cooked, huge. they cooked on that side. This is they would port this, so we, they would run ahead of us, sprint ahead of us, and I got pictures of that where they would sprint ahead of us, set up this giant tent where they would then start the meal. Yeah. We'd get there. We, you know, we'd sit at the table. Here's a picture of Gary putting on the pack that they wear. <laughs> oh my god, so Gary, look how big it is. Look at Buddy. Look at him. Yeah. Look at the size. How small that guy is. It's Sixty to eighty pounds. And so Gary's explaining how how heavy that is. And then when you're going up some of the hills and stuff. I love your hat, by the way. Your yeah, hippie long stack. Oh, my hat. Yeah, he bought that in Peru. Yeah, yeah that, that in for the listeners that can't see the pictures, uh, essentially, um, if you take two F-150 pickup trucks and put them in the end, <laughs> that's about the size of this mess hall that they're setting up. And the pack that Gary had on his back that must have been 90 I mean, pounds looked like a, I think your audience would know 60, about 60 to 80 pounds. And you're, I mean, we had nine. That's why they would carry our personal stuff. We, we all had packs. Packs that we were allowed to keep 15 pounds in, up to 15 pounds, yeah, well, which we went over. Okay, by the way, the, the biggest tip I can give your folks, is, and it was a tip given by our guys, is um, put whatever you can fit in your pack the first day, put it in there. By the second day, whatever you can put in your duffel bag for the porters to carry, put that in there mm -hmm. and make your pack as light as possible. Those guys are used to carrying that stuff. Obviously, if you put a couple extra pounds in there, they're not going to notice the difference. But if you got an extra couple of pounds because you haven't done this trail before, yeah, whoa. And, and like Scott said, that second day going up, it's tough. Now, what what are you paying for the for the guide services? I so, mean, I know that's. I mean, a, I mean, Gary did all the negotiation on that. We we, we had an awesome tour guide. Yeah. And, and going back, they would give that. We went to a meeting when we landed where they would all hand everybody a duffel bag, and you could have up to fifteen pounds. To Gary's point, all the hotels would weigh us. So they had weighed So they would weigh the 15 pounds. And, but then my tour guide lifted up my, my backpack. He said, way too heavy. Throw some more stuff in your duffel bag tonight. And that's what Gary said. <laughs> He's helping you out. Yeah, he said, dude, just throw some of there. Because once you're on the trail, nobody's weighing that bag. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that way, I, like Gary said, the first day, which was the easiest hike day, I had probably 40 pounds on I me. Mean, that's a legitimate when fact. You, when you count, we had a 100 milliliter or 100 milliliter um, camelback. Filled. You know, yeah. I had water bottles on both sides. We had food, had a raincoat, and stuff like that. Once you figure out the weather and stuff, I put my, you know, other stuff. 
in the uh, duffel bag that night and got down to about 25 pounds. So, so let's talk about water. You guys, uh, you're just using the filter in the streams? Like how you get your we water? We got there. We went, the first thing we did was we went to a grocery store and we, I bought these giant liters of water and we used that to fill us up. And the guy said, the first day on the hike, you don't want to use the streams. We all had filters, right? Yeah, because filter. they're further down. Yeah. They're further down, so it's, they're not a good. And after seeing the guy peeing in the creek, I, I understand. <laughs> and so, you got all the right. chicken in there that's... Yeah. Uh, and then they would boil water for us every morning. So every morning. They, they would fill us up. Uh, okay. So I, did, I didn't have a camelback. I just did it with a couple of bottles, plastic mm -hmm. bottles that I bought. They would give us two liters. And I definitely drank the least amount of water out of the group. Um, you were the, also the only one who did not take... Altitude sickness right. medicine. So three of us took that. Well, that, that was a question on my list because the elevation of Machu Picchu is uh, around 70,000. We get close, close to 14,000 feet. So because the hike up, we're at 13,981. So oh, very close before to you come down. Yeah, on the second day before you come down. So there was a lady who was I an unbelievable you. athlete that I that I hiked with on the mm -hmm. thing. She said she had diarrhea for four days. She's never had altitude sickness like this in her life. And she's from Canada and was in, in great shape. She did not take the medicine. I, I had taken the medicine before on a 14er, and it's it's worked for me. The only negative, and we were joking about this earlier, is I had Matt, who had never hiked, take it. We have to take it two days before we go. What it does to you is it makes soda taste so bad. <laughs> so Matt, that's that, I need that. Matt's that. telling his story where he goes to a restaurant in Philly and he drinks a Coke and he's like, oh, something's wrong with your tap. Returns it, goes to a Wawa, which is a local convenience store in the Northeast for some of your listeners, and buys a 20 ounce Coke and then realizes it's got to be the pills because he tastes it again. It tastes like ass. And he's like, oh, this is horrible. And that is the side effect, which is good because I drink, I, I have caffeine headaches. So along the the hike, there wasn't coffee in the morning. I've never had coffee. I always have one soda a day, Mountain Dew and Dr. Pepper. So I was really worried about that because that, the last thing I wanted was just major headaches as you're trying to enjoy it. Um, a gentleman you're very familiar with, Steve Scornia, had told me about these crystal light caffeine packets. Yeah. And I would just pour, I would carry an empty bottle of water in this neighborhood. So I went with them, took pictures just to see the experience. And then I went over to KFC or pizza for dinner and they finished eating their 11 course or 15 course meal. And you saw some of the pictures of the food. Not all these pictures we can provide for your Facebook page. But um, it was an experience. But well, I got to tell you, everything on that menu tasted fine. Tasted it's an really good. The chef comes out and explains yeah, to you, so, right? Well, the, yeah. So it's by altitude. Yes. The, so so essentially, you, you have these different altitudes in Peru, and it, it's dishes based on that. And so you have some seafood, you have some mountain stuff, and, the, and it's this whole thing. They explain it to you. There's a lot of presentation. They tell you what you can eat and what you can't eat because some things on the plate they say are very poisonous. Okay. Um, so there is a presentation factor to it. And when you eat it, it doesn't, you know, like piranha, the piranhas are staring you in the face. It's not what you eat. <laughs> Dude, that's the picture that you we know, need to have on the Facebook page because they look hideous. They are. And, and I got to tell you, those teeth, I wouldn't want to get bitten by one oh, of those yeah, things. No but, but it was, you know, it didn't taste bad. And again, part of, um, you know, going to Peru and going on the Inca Trail and, and, and Machu Picchu and stuff, it's about doing stuff that you don't have the opportunity to do here. Yeah, um, sure. You know, hiking on the, on, up to Machu Picchu, you can't do something like that here in the United States. So I figured part of it was the food. Well, you know, one of the things we haven't really talked about to get back to the trail was the, the scenery. I mean, the pictures oh, you guys had were phenomenal. And I haven't even posted half the pictures. I mean, I'm, you're still I'm working still, on the video. I'm still working on the video because I want to make it as epic as it was. The problem is, again, I don't have drone footage, so, you know, it's pretty much just a selfie stick, and that's where all the video's coming from or phones and stuff like that. So it's, it's hard to put into perspective what – hiking amongst these mountains are and when you look back at the trail and you're like oh my god i just hiked from over there on the other side of that mountain because you're crossing mountains mm -hmm. and you're going around these places and sometimes you don't you know i, I had to always be reminded by william or one of the porters that we were uh, hiking with look back because you're so focused on looking forward and getting to, to where you're going. Yeah. You don't, you don't look, look back. Yeah. Yeah. And, you you know, it, it's kind of a motto for life. Um, yeah. There's a piranha shot. Oh, those teeth are so nasty. Yeah. Oh, my God. You got, 
I definitely got to put some pictures up. Yeah, and so and like we were saying, this restaurant is all about altitude. So obviously the parameters were below sea level, so zero. So yeah. But there's a picture of the menu that I can show you that shows all that stuff. So it was interesting. I mean, it, it isn't for me. It isn't my thing. So yeah, there's the menu, so you can kind of see like they would tell you what altitude. How hey, so uh, one of the questions I had we haven't gotten to yet is on language. I mean, I was just looking at your menu, which made me think of it. Um, now, how critical, it's obviously not that critical to know Spanish. I'm sure well, it's very, well, don't even well, speak Spanish. Yeah, it depends on what do they speak. Well, they speak Spanish. No, no, the porters had a different language. Remember, Williams oh, spoke right. it, but it was called, um, if you said it, I would know it. It's another language. It's a language basically of the Incas or, right. or whatever. It's, okay, it's so he had actually an Inca So heritage. he, he oh, could yeah. speak Spanish in that, so he would translate. Like So when I was talking to him, I mean, he, it was another complete language. Um, well, and, 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 and to your point, you don't have to know. I mean, none of us knew Spanish at all. Virginia knew more than I knew. Yeah, she Virginia was definitely the... the, the, the she Spanish helped me get my pizza one night by saying right. no tomatoes. I, I don't know how that worked. <laughs> right. But it, I, no, I don't, it's, yeah. it's not necessary. Um, you know, Google even sells these earbuds now that will translate in your ear live. Oh, you that's know, interesting. Whatever language. Oh, yeah, the technology now. And we Google Translate apps. works yeah. pretty well. Um, so I don't, you know, don't let language make the decision. You should go because you want the scenery. It yeah, is unbelievable. Right. It's something that, by the way, I give Gary credit. I didn't know much about Machu Picchu and it wasn't on my radar. But when you go there and there's a book called Turn Right at Machu Picchu that really talks about it. And it's fascinating. It's in the middle of nowhere. And yeah. to hike the Inca Trail to get there is very satisfying. And the, the ruins that you see along the way and the experience that you have is so well worth it. If if any of your listeners even think about taking a bus or a train, never listen to your podcast ever again. Because <laughs> they're, they're not the target never, audience. No, right? they, they absolutely, right. because there's no way, again, it was so unsatisfying for me to walk through the sun gate and then see a guy with white socks and sandals with a selfie stick. They walked how far to get there? That we walked it, a mile. It's, now, it's a good mile up the hill. Up from the, the hill. Bus station. He's at Machu Picchu to walk up to the gates. Yeah. Oh, Machu Picchu, you're right there. Right. I mean, so, like there. from the from the parking lot to Machu Picchu, how far? Yeah. 15, 20 feet. No, oh, it's not really. Yeah. It's that easy. There is no parking lot uh, really. It, you literally have to take a bus up there and they drop you off. Yeah. Wow. The bus is. And the bus takes you down to the train station. Yeah, you take a train to Machu Picchu City and then a bus runs you up to. Machu Picchu. And now, how, how long do they, they let you kind of wander the Machu Picchu area as long as you want? Yeah, so, we, you want? You talk, so we got there. and Because that looked cool to me. I mean, yeah. it looks so, like all the rooms awesome. and all the, you know. It, it was awesome. Uh, the only thing is our, our tour guide by this time got really sick, which is weird. He had lost his voice. So he hooked us up with another tour guide, which is ironic. So this tour guide gives us a tour. And when you get to Machu Picchu, they don't allow any drinks or any food. You can't have a backpack. You can't have a backpack. You have to check your backpack. So can you, you take pictures inside? Oh, yeah, yeah. You can yeah. take pictures, but you cannot bring your backpack or anything else. So when you walk in, you... um. Now, you think it's because they don't want food wrappers and water bottles? Yeah, they, they, they try to. I think so. And okay. also, you've got... um, What, what are the... Um, Oh, llamas. You have llamas walking yeah. around all over the place. Well, it, well they, don't, they don't mow the grass, and they don't do a lot of upkeep on it. So the llamas are there just to... Make sure that the grass doesn't get out of control. Mm. But you've got them just walking around. You know what I mean? Rappers and stuff like that. Yeah, so, yeah, that makes sense. But the sun was boiling on us, and this guy sat us against so that the That shocks me. That would have, that really surprised me because you're at a pretty high elevation. Well, there. right outside there's bars. You can leave, and here's the thing: when you go in, you're allowed to leave once and come back in. So yeah. you could go out and get water, but you can't bring it in. You you can go outside and get something to drink and eat once, and then go back in. But we're on a tour with this guy. He literally sits us against a wall where the sun is behind you, just beating on us. For and he does this. Yeah, I fell asleep. I fell asleep. It was fascinating, but at this point, we had two and a half hours of sleep. We had just hiked in. We all smelled like crap, and we're all behind the thirst. And this guy—we don't have any water. And yeah, and this guy is passionate, which I appreciated. About he had studied the you know Machu Picchu and how it's how it's designed to see all these stars and how the astrology affects it. And so once that tour was over, yeah, it wasn't ran to get something. It wasn't him. It was the day. Yeah. It's the last day. William, our God, gets sick. So he's waiting for us outside. We get this new guy. We get introduced to him. We get hooked up with a couple other people we really didn't know. And we're sitting there in the sun and just baking. And all I'm thinking about is get me out of Machu Picchu so I can get a drink in a Snickers bar. <laughs> a Snickers because bar. Because I'm starving. Oh and then we knew at, you know, at 12 or 1 o'clock we had to meet William. 
And the problem is, and, and you, you'll see this at Machu Picchu a lot, and you hear a lot of people talk about this in Machu Picchu, the lines are just unbelievable. For, for Machu Picchu. You mean for uh, for food, yeah. drinks, and food? For the bathroom? And you had food, food drinks, the bathroom. The bathroom. Yeah, the bathroom was nice. I mean, it was nice bus. to finally wash my face with a sink. The so they had running water at Machu Picchu. It was great. That we, was a big um, breakthrough. So no showers on the trail. That's not going to happen. There, 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 there was a shower, and I went one time. But honestly, they run yes. it through a creek. It is ice it's cold. Ice it's snow melt. Yeah. So I turned on the shower to wash up. But I mean, I got yeah. like, I had like third degree frost <laughs> from trying to wash up. I came out of there a woman. Essentially, yeah. I had some... Exfoliating apricot scrub with me for my face and stuff, just to kind of wipe the dirt away. And I, that was one of the other times when I left because I had just washed my face with the warm water that they had provided us, and that was the day when we saw them dump the water out, and then they used their feet that night to clean it. And Scott's like, "Look over there!" And I just, I just died laughing. I mean, I couldn't help but laugh. But then the next morning, I'm like. Do I really want to use my apricot, you know, scrub on my face with that water that they're using to wash their feet on? Oh, it gets worse. So you'll, uh, you, you can relate to this, uh, bird shooter, is that I have to pee so much because of the oxygen medicine and the water you drink <laughs> that I kept a Gatorade bottle in my tent because one night I'm like, I just don't want to get out. <laughs> it's of called tent. it's called Mister Yuck. There, it's an actually it's a it's a yeah. technique that's been tested. So I I got up in the middle of the night and I peed in this Gatorade bottle. And I filled it, uh, but I was able to stop, no problem. I, of course, then had to pee four more times. But I had to fill it <laughs> so that morning, I I poured. I, well, I, you I, actually gave it to the check woman for her uh, her <laughs> no, no. Caps, right? Well, that that morning, I I got out of the tent with a full bottle of um, urine, a uh, full Gatorade bottle of urine, and I poured it out. And then I went and threw the Gatorade bottle into this garbage can that they had set up for us. And I watched those guys pick the Gatorade bottle out of the garbage and recycle it. And recycle it. No. So everybody was like, dude, are you going to tell them? I'm like, I, they don't speak our language. I don't know what to tell them. But it was, I felt bad in a way, but I, I'm pretty healthy and they'll just make them stronger. I had perfect yeah, bodies for 12 years. Urine you know. is sterile, so you're yeah, there you go. used it to pour the water into our food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Stuff. To boil. But yeah, it was an unbelievable experience. I want to make sure that, that for your listeners, um, that we do cover because it is something I think we'd highly recommend to go. And, and Gary just shared an article yesterday that Peru is like the, the, um, yeah, capital of food. Well, and, and, and so to get to some pointers, if you're going to do this, book it early. Like we said, that guy booked it two years in advance. That's probably the best thing to do. We booked this about six, we, I think six we made it, yeah, we made it in February. Um, well, December we had made the decision, yeah. Yeah, we had made January the January 28th is we, when we had uh, the, I think January 28th. Yeah. And we took off July 28th. So it was and exactly there were, six there months. were three people who were supposed to go with us who delayed their payments to the tour company. And by the time they got around to paying the tour company, the tour company said, hey, the, the permits are done. One person missed it by five minutes. Yes. Oh, we yes. had this other person go on this, and they had just given away the last visa. Because like yeah. Gary said, there's 500 people a day allowed, and that's it. So you, you've got to pick your the, – the way I researched it was I picked the tour company. I, I just went to TripAdvisor, found the top tour company, which was Aspis Peru, they had great recommendations about food, and, and I know Scott had some dietary issues, so I made sure that there was a place that could do good food for Me, us. Meaning pizza and wings well, required. No, yeah. no they, made sure, they made sure they loaded up on bread, because you need carbs, yes. obviously, for the hike, but I don't eat much else, but they were they were very accommodating, and our tour guide, we couldn't, we were all friends with him on Facebook yeah. now, super nice guy, and um, he was great. Well, now, what was the, co- we kind of danced around this. I don't know if you ever answered. What was the sort of the cost just for the guiding part? So Obviously, was, you got to get thousand depends, bucks. Yeah, it depends on how many wow, people go. Less than I would have thought. But it, it, I but think ten, five days, it was right? six people. Four days. Nine, four days, three nights. I think it was 960 it wound up to be. 960 or 980. We, say, we each saved, uh, it was going to be 1,200. And then, yeah. at, then two other people who had already signed up, they said, do you mind going with these two other people? Who ended up being great. The guy yeah. was a doctor at Baylor University Hospital in Dallas, and his wife was an art teacher. So it was those two and us four. Because we got over five, they dropped it to yeah, it was like nine hundred eight nine hundred eighty dollars a person or something like that. And that included everything, all the porters, the transportation. We we got the best car on the train ride back, like an all glass car, um, meals, all Vista that stuff. Dome, I think it was called. The, yeah, the addition and for the, the hotel really wasn't expensive. So yeah, yeah was that that gets you the entire Inca experience. So from the day you get on the hiking trail to the day you leave, Monica, okay. is what we did for the hotel. And then we flew from. 
uh, Cusco to, to Lima and said, let's spend the day in Lima. We spent the night, and then we flew direct back to Miami the next day. Yeah, I think the total cost for my entire trip was somewhere around – um, 1,600 to 1,800 that seems, that seems incredibly reasonable for that yeah. experience. But yeah, I loaded up on a lot of gummy bears and beef jerky. I, I had a lot of extra food when it was all said and done. Um, but for the most part, I didn't, we, I, I, we packed perfectly. I think that the, the, we had one outside parachute. of the sleeping bag and, and things of that sort of, if you're going to rent a mattress pad, you have to rent, at least rent a mattress pad. Oh. Um, the inflatable one, yeah. Right. You have to do that because, again, sleeping on, if you're used to it, fine, but the yeah. rocks were just horrible. Yeah. Um, outside of that, the poles, I think, uh, yeah. were absolutely Did you take hiking sticks? I know, I know uh, I cardiac here did. We yeah. had one guy, on the, one guy in our group rent poles from them, and he left them at one of the ruins, and they could never find them again. Right. And it cost them 60 bucks. 60 bucks. bucks. And, and he rented them. They were $3 a day, but he ended up having to pay 60 bucks for the poles, which I, at the end is fine. They charge you more for that here, probably. If you yeah. Well, I mean, and, and, the poles and, saved my life. Because yeah, I almost fell a couple of times and going for the pole. I think the majority of stuff that I took um, outside of toiletries and, and stuff like that, I got on Amazon for pretty reasonable prices. Like we said, we twenty dollars sleeping bag and we just left them. I, mean, I didn't want to take the sleeping. I gave them extra bag. food, the sleeping bag. Um, yeah, and and I, I think the poles. The other thing you really want to invest in again, I think if you're going on this trip, is a good camera. No. Okay. Um, iPhones today have really good cameras on them, so I don't know that you necessarily need a great camera, but you want something that you can take pictures on. And I think the, one of the biggest things that, that I was able to do was I brought one of the uh, portable battery packs so that if my phone or my camera or, or anything ran out, I at least had some extra juice because there's no place to charge, there's no place to, to actually pl plug in. You don't need a computer. You do, you know, you want to minimize what you bring. But that was the one thing, Gary. You brought a lot of that. I mean, that, that was I brought a lot of I know for his audience, they're yeah. going to say, this guy's carrying a lot of I brought weight. a ton of batteries, and I, I essentially changed it. Like we talked about, the first day I was carrying them. The second day I put them in my duffel bag. And that, that's probably a good point that we haven't explained. When you hire a tour company, they allow you this, this 15 kilograms to put in a duffel bag. 15 pounds, so, yeah. Yeah, so each 15 pounds. So each day in the morning when you wake up, you pack your things into a duffel bag, and then you have your pack on your back. So the duffel bag goes with the porters. So essentially what I had was the first day I, I was hiking with all of these batteries. I think I had three portable batteries that were able to recharge a phone like but six I'm gonna times. But I'm 12 to 15 extra pounds probably in the batteries. Yeah, no, it was easily. It was, it was a lot of weight. And I had enough juice. To, I had way too many. I would say one larger battery would be plenty. I was also bringing those because I was able to charge the drone batteries if I could take the drone with me too. Sure, right. So that's why I had all those batteries as well. So um, batteries are important. Uh, a camera is important. Um, I didn't use bug strawberry whatsoever. We talked about I didn't take any of the altitude medication. Um, definitely stock up on some, some Snickers bars and, and things of that sort, some food that you like. Um, because something that you know, maybe a, a oh, was it a modium that the other two had to take? I know we we yeah. didn't have issues. <laughs> the way there you were talking, it sounds like you did take some. No, there was no, there was good things to bring. People. Yeah, because that stuff happens. That yeah. you know, outside of the food and stuff, you may just be stressed, and your body may just you know kind of go on you. And it, nobody knows what their body's going to no. do if you've never been to fourteen thousand feet. Yeah, right. Nobody knows what their body's going to do at fourteen thousand feet. So it's important to kind of be prepared. I. I and, took a leave every day. I took yeah, Ambien at night. Yeah, yeah that's and night the other thing. To sleep. Because remember, you're you're sleeping in a tent and people are out. And the, port, the porters would party. You have a lot of snores, yes. to your point. But you also have... He's got to snore. The port, yeah, well, well, I think out. everybody was at one point. <laughs> yeah. the, 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 yeah, the porters going at it um, one night, too. The, porter, the porters all sleep in the food tent. Yeah, they all, sleep all, in the, they, So they... They, they line them up. They have a let, there was 11 people yeah. total. Because you had the cook and the tour guide. Or the tour guide in his own tent. But you had... It ended up eleven people like lined up and yeah. The tour guide's like a king. Yeah. He's got his own tent. They cook for him. Yeah, right. He's the only guy who speaks English. Yeah, President. Yeah, yeah. No, I, and but he does this every. I mean, literally, he had one day off after we got back, and then he was taking a, a newlywed couple who who wanted for some reason for their honeymoon to hike the Inca Trail, which is amazing. But I mean, you really have to marry a, a woman that would want to do this, and and he, and he was taking them up on a private tour. But boom, here he is going another thirty miles. Of hiking right after he does it with us. Yeah. 
So, so the I mean, obviously the guide spoke English without a doubt. Yeah, our guide was awesome. William was awesome, and then he had a name we could pronounce. I mean, it was great. That'd probably be interesting. What we'll do is maybe, maybe we'll put his name in. So if you go to Aspis Peru or something, you can yeah. kind of request him. Yeah, well, I could put it a link on the uh, website. Yeah, I'll ask. Him. You know, it'd be interesting to probably hang out with those guys and have a few cocktails late late night. The the stories that they told that William told on the trail, and, and again, I wish I had had some type of language ability to speak with the porters because I think their stories would even be better. Um, but you know, what, what's funny is I, I'm in fairly good shape and I, I was going fast on the trail. I could find, um, as I was walking up and stuff, I would see these, these porters pass me and some of the locals pass me. And so, you know, I've got these special shoes and you want to avoid blisters and, you know, socks and, and all this stuff. And then here comes this guy going 100 miles a minute, wearing freaking sandals, almost bare feet that have been like ripped in several different places because he can't afford anything. And he's one of the locals and he's flying by me. Yeah. And, you know, he, it kind of makes you, gives you a little bit of perspective that why am I, why do I need these $100 or $200 pair of boots, hiking boots with, with special socks and this $500 jacket? That I've got. Um, I, I yeah, your bought, apricot shrub. Too. Yeah, my apricot shrub. <laughs> it probably costs like three hundred bucks. And I will small tell you, I will tell you, the second night when you're camping at altitude, you're at about thirteen thousand feet. I didn't bring a, a lot of um, warm clothes because I figured, hey, we're going to be hiking and I'll be kind of hot, and I'll make sure that I at least have some layers. But I didn't bring. I brought some long pants with some lining in them, and right. I thought they were going to be warm enough. Well, when we got to the, I, I showed them to uh, William prior to us hiking, and he goes, "Yeah, you're probably going to want to get something." And he goes, "I'll show you what you want to get." So, before on your two-hour um, bus ride, they usually stop at this place. It's just a little store, and I bought these um, alpaca pants that are wool pants. Yeah, I've seen them. And I got to tell you, they saved my life on that second night. Um, Virginia got them as well. I think they were like ten bucks. Mm. If you can buy them, buy them because I, I got it. There was no way I would have survived that second night, even in a mummy bag with three pairs of pants that were on me. Mm. Um, what, what temperature do you think it got down to that night? Oh, I think it easily got down to twenty-five yeah, Fahrenheit. Cool. You lightweights. <laughs> uh, well, I think oh, I you're in a forty-degree uh, sleeping bag. bag. Yeah. It wasn't like a you know. Uh, super the mummy bag. I think I was at thirty degree mummy bag, but it was freezing. And I, I mean, I had long underwear on, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it was just from the night before being perfect. Yeah, yeah. So well, then you're freezing going out too hot it falls. Yeah. I mean, it was it was nuts. So you guys ready for three closing questions? Fire away. Yeah. The big thought provokers. <laughs> yeah, true false. <laughs> <laughs> no more true false. Yeah. So we can't get these wrong. No, you cannot get these wrong. <laughs> All right, guys. So, final a, a few final questions for you. Um, thought provokers. Yeah. Well, what, what surprised you guys the most about Machu Picchu? I'll let Scott answer first. I honestly just how beautiful it was, and that it was so undiscovered, and that only thirty percent of what we saw it has been uncovered. Because, like, when you're on the trail and in the jungles, you're on the Inca Trail, and it was all handmade. So it was amazing that way. So, I mean, and it really for somebody who didn't know much about it and didn't really do much research, I, I've become mesmerized by it. I've read the book, you know, Turn Right at Machu Picchu. I've definitely watched documentaries on it since I got back because I felt sort of a, an attachment to it. It was just amazing. And everybody in Peru was super nice. And the one other thing that we didn't bring up earlier, besides Machu Picchu, in Cusco City and in Machu Picchu City, Dogs run freely. Mm. I, I mean, there's like hundreds of dogs, and they're walking down the street like you're in the movie Zootopia, and you have animals. They don't bother you. They're all different breeds, but they just walk up and down the streets, <laughs> and you go about your business. When we were in Lima, I didn't see that as much. I didn't see any dogs on the street, but both, I mean, right in, right when we got to Cusco, you're walking down the street, and your first, um, the ability to get nervous, right? You're like, oh, there's a dog coming at me. Is this a rabid dog? Like, what's going on? But they were all very friendly, and I mean, Gary's a dog lover, so he was uh, into yeah. most of them that came by. But, but for most of us, I mean, it was just, it was interesting. So, okay. Well, and, interesting. And, and, and one of the moments, actually, you brought up, one of the moments I laughed hardest was it was we had our final buffet lunch, and Scott had his pizza, and then they send you off to shop in the town of Aguas Calientes. And um, 
I turned around, I was looking at something and I hear this loud bang and I turn around and there's Scott who had just tipped over this poor woman's entire hat stand. I mean, it exploded. <laughs> it was unbelievable. It's like a I just reached for a hat so yeah, open, and the whole thing just starts crashing down in the middle of this flea market. Probably 80 hats, and I have a great picture yeah. of him trying to put it back together, and the woman's it like patting him on the back. But again, everybody's super nice. I didn't get arrested. Nobody got upset. No, but, but uh, what I, I think the one thing I, I remember about is, is just – Get in shape if you're going to do this. Um, Scott did great. I mean, I know Scott trained on it. And, and but not as much as I could have. And I will tell you, it made me want to be a, be a healthy. I felt yeah. great there. And I don't know if yeah. it's that. It's like endorphins, too. You get hooked on. Yeah. Well, you exercise every you're day. You're out in the open. And, and I can I Fresh can air, no smog. The entire time, there is something epic that you're looking at. Meaning the mountains, the trees, the, the fog. I've got seven or eight different uh, unbelievable time lapses. And that was the other thing. I was kind of, I, I never had enough time to do the time lapses that I wanted. Um, I got this great star time lapse and it took me 60 minutes to get three seconds of the stars moving across with this snow capped mountain in the area. And that's what I'll remember is a lot of the, the, the pictures and the compositions that I saw in the pictures and, and just not having time to set that stuff up because you're you're going you have you have a lot of hiking on the, this this trail to do and again we did the classic four day Inca hike. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other different hikes that you can wind up in Machu Picchu with, um, but but I think the the one thing I remember is just everywhere you turn and every time you turn around, there is something gorgeous. And, and when you get to that sun gate. And you get your first peak of Machu, Machu Picchu, and the sun is kind of rising behind your back. And you see the clouds kind of rolling a, a, across Huanu Picchu, which is the typical, that's the big mountain in Machu Picchu that you see that some people pay extra to hike. When you see those clouds and you see that sun, and, and, and I kind of, you know, again, I think I did a lot more research than most of the people on my trip. It just got emotional when you get up to this space, and it's just this gorgeous kind of, you know, when you, you, you have these theatrical movies where they play this music, and in my head, that was that <laughs> kind of, you know, that, that whole episode of just stuff. So I'll never forget that moment. Just, you know, the 20 minutes I think we spent at the, the Sun Gate. I, I would tell your listeners, if they want to do Machu Picchu, do it sooner. And if they're worried about being in shape, there is a new trail being made yes. right now. When I say do it sooner, what we went through, what Gary and I experienced, we, we, I think we went at the right time because there's the Inca Trail. They are now creating another trail that is flatter, that doesn't go up the mountain, doesn't go to the 4,000 feet, kind of just goes directly at Machu Picchu, more at a seven or 8,000 elevation, and it'll be easier for people, but it, it won't have the same experience that what we had. Now, they'll probably still keep the Inca Trail open, though, right? Yeah, okay. but I don't know how that's going to limit people, or does that expand the amount of people there? I, I felt, for the trail itself, I never felt crowded. I never felt like we were overwhelmed on the trail. When we got to Machu Picchu, it did feel like you, you see like ants just running, because as you're at the gates that Gary talked about, you look down and you see the people starting to walk up the hill. Mm -hmm. There's um, um, there, there's a five-day, um, Salkane, mm -hmm. I think is what it's called, um, and that trail, they tell you, it's it's very it's unusual to see another person. Um, this trail, the Inca Trail, I, I don't I never felt crowded on the trail, but you definitely there's not really too many moments when you're by yourself. Unless you're out of shape and way in the back. Right. <laughs> Scott experienced it the second day, and I experienced the second day going down as well because. I was doing a lot of I time walked with the tour guide up and he walked with the tour guide yeah. down. I, th I think I was <laughs> so a couple yeah, hours I was a couple hours behind everybody on the way down. Um, but I was doing a lot of just um, you know, picture taking and setting up for time lapses. And I got some epic, epic time lapses. Now you guys both mentioned you'd like to go back to Peru. Um, if you did go back, where would you go? Rainbow Mountain would be one. That yeah. was a hike we saw pictures yeah. and that, that's a tough hike. Also that, guided, right? Yeah, you yeah. can. I think you can do that on your own. You can do yeah. that on your own. In fact, you can drive up to it, and I think it's only like a, um, a very short hike to the top. But it's it's and it's drone friendly, which I found out oh, later. Well, Lennon told me that you can take. He said if you you know come back, bring your good drone, and we'll go up to Rainbow Mountain. 
I mean, it's cool to know we were in the Andes Mountains. Like, I, I, those are things that I researched after the hike, to know that, that the mountains was part of the Andes Range yeah. that we were hiking. And it's somebody who's hiked the Smokies like yourself. I mean, you're in different parts and you don't realize, you know. There is the so Mountains. much. I, I follow this one guy on, um, on YouTube, ben, Brendan Van Song. He's a, um, a photographer. And I chatted with him a little bit before I went to Peru because he brought his Phantom um, to Peru literally like two weeks before we got there. Now, he didn't do the Inca Trail hike. He went to Machu Picchu and he said, hey, you can't have a drone in Machu Picchu. Um, but he, he, he did a full two weeks in Peru. And some of the stuff that he did just out in the middle of nowhere with just these epic vistas and, and some of the landscapes that he caught, just that's what I would go back to Peru for. If you want more of the city stuff, um, follow, you know, go into Lima. I think Lima was a Cusco's. Cusco's a pretty good sized city, but Lima definitely is the more modern of the of the two. Yeah, but I, I didn't find it. I, I enjoyed Cusco better. Cusco's. Really. I think Cusco's Lima was, was not a city. That I thought it was going to be so much more. And the tallest building is a hotel in Lima, yeah. and that's like the only modern building. And it really, it just. I mean, it's on the water, which is nice. But it was kind of. It was a great day too. We were only there a day, so I don't really yeah. get a, a full look and feel. Any one thing that you guys would do differently if you did it again? Which you probably wouldn't, but if you did. I, I don't know. Honestly, I, I don't know that there was anything I you think, could have done differently. Well, I think the flight there, the you, flights. Yeah, I mean, the time. The flights were tough because we took off at 10 at night at in a, Atlanta yeah. to go down to, to Miami. Miami to take off at 2 a.m. to get to. Go through Columbia where we had an yeah. hour and a half later to get to Cusco. So we got there at 11 15 in the next morning. That was tough. It was only six hundred and some dollars, so we went right. for our savings there. And then coming back, I mean, the direct to Miami wasn't bad. But I think I think if you time it right, you can get direct flights from Miami for around eight hundred dollars round trip. Okay. We wound up paying dirt cheap fares, um, mm -hmm. which were very cheap. But it was. Um, but it knocked us out. And I think, I think all, yeah, I think that wiped out when you got there. Yeah. That would be my one thing is is you know the time. It's not a, too much of a time difference. Um, what time zone are they on? Are they uh, like uh, it's only one hour behind? Yeah. They're on the central, central, time zone. central time zone, right? Well, we did like a red eye, and it was—I mean, it was a tough red eye too. Yeah, well, it was tough because you're—I think you're in Colombia. We were sitting around for like an hour and a half in Colombia, yeah. and then going through customs there, and then going to yeah. So I, I think if I had to do one thing differently, I think that would be it. As far as the trail or booking or anything of that sort, we stayed. What would do? Was it the Hilton Garden in Cusco? We stayed in. Um, no, it was a. Um, it wasn't a hill. Novotel. 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 Novotel, Cusco. I would highly hotel. recommend that hotel. Great location. Walk uh, around. Fantastic showers and bathrooms in there. The beds, super, super comfortable. Really centrally located. Well worth any extra money that you're going to pay. It was only 90 bucks a night. Well, yeah. and European that was... Chain, that was yes. Yeah, yeah, European. Yeah. I think so. Morgan and... and, and um, Liz. Liz stayed up at the top of the They stayed at the Hilton Garden. Yeah. They stayed at the Hilton Garden, and it's well outside of the city, um, up on top of a hill. And so you probably don't stuff. want to stay there. Um, again, the Novotel, I think, is perfect, perfect location inside the city. It's right, I think it's like three blocks from the Plaza de Armas. Yeah, very close. It was great. Um, and it's, 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 and the Plaza de Armas is the center of the city. Um, and that's where I got that cool hat. That's where you knocked over the headstand. No, 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 that was at that was at, that was in August. <laughs> yeah. That was after four days. I mean, we're yeah. dirty. No, we're we're just walking. She around. was just happy you walked out of there. Let's like, just go. Yeah. I mean, it's just you don't under, you don't appreciate anything until it's over, and that's the sad thing. Is that for me, I was so stressed about can I make it? Can I do the hike? Can I get through it? That there really wasn't time to really embrace it. Like when you did the Appalachian Trail, I think you had enough time to really. I mean, I'm sure part of you is like, I just want to get this over with to say I completed it. It's the disconnection, though. You can just disconnect and really let your mind go. Yeah, for us, I was just like worried about, okay, we've got another day of no shower and sleeping. Let's get through this. And I don't think I appreciated it at the time. It's like when somebody said, I wish I knew when the good old days were. Well, you know, let's bring that up for the listeners because, I mean, that was the first time you'd ever done a multi-day backpacking. First time I ever camped out without Cub Scouts. Yeah, that, that was the first was time. the first time I, It was the first time I ever slept in a tent. Okay. Yeah. First, you didn't even like car camping in a state I park. Never did. That oh thing. my god! So I, I did not know. That that. Was, there you go, listeners. There's was, your encouragement right there. Yeah, if he could do that, and and, and I had I had, had a germaphobe. 
Well, I am a germaphobe, but I also had some... With, with, uh, uh, with the apricots from... I, I had from. some Advil PM kind of stuff that, that I took at night to sleep. Yeah. And I slept really well and didn't wake up very... I woke up sore, so I had Advil and stuff, but... That was the first time I ever slept in a tent. So and no critters keeping you up. Uh, no, no uh, interesting wildlife. Really. You Gary see after wants to stars. You, you yeah. have more time. I literally hit the went to bed and I was exhausted. Um, the 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 first night I stayed up, I did. We went. I went to a little party. They, they, it was Independence Day, mm -hmm. so I it was so loud I couldn't fall asleep. So I walked with one of the porters up just you know a little bit, and we went to this church, and they were the locals were partying. Then um, the second night. I stayed up and I did a star lapse, time lapse for an hour. I was freezing my balls off that <laughs> night. Um, and I climbed into the tent. The third night um, was the worst campsite by far. Um, and we didn't have a very good spot. And so there was really nothing to do. So I just immediately went to bed. But you had to wake up at 3 in the morning to hike with your headlamp on. That last day. And that last day, I mean, just it can't be overstated. You need a headlamp if you go on this. Absolutely 100%. You ride not, around. Yeah. 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 Do not bring a flashlight. Buy a headlamp off of uh, Amazon for, for 10, 15 bucks. Because that last night, 3.30 in the morning, you're getting up. You're on the side of a mountain. And you're hiking for a good three, four hours prior to the sunrise. With yeah. a brutal cliff to your With the side brutal, left. The cliff is on your right. The cliff is on your left. You go up these things called the monkey stairs, which are they call the gringo killers. And it's about 50 to 80 stairs up. And so you're literally on all, on all fours hiking up. And you don't want to go up these monkey stairs with a freaking flashlight in your hand. Yeah. Because if you fall backwards, you're going off the mountain. Well, you know, I had the question on there, and I didn't ask it earlier when I'm into. I mean, are there? I mean, like the danger factor here. Like, I, I will tell you that I don't understand. Luckily, none of us, none of our group got hurt. I mean, I think a lot of people turn stuff. ankles. And yeah, I did. Break I turned ankles and stuff. Yeah. Um, I, nobody got hurt. I would say on a danger rating, like ten would the be the opportunity was up there. Ten would be like um, jumpsuit flying or those wingsuit things, and, and one would be like Disneyland. <laughs> um, you know, small world after all. I'd say this is probably a six as far as danger goes. I would have said a seven. Wow, yeah. that's higher than I would have thought, actually. I, I was I thinking you were going to come into the middle. you're on the edge, I mean, there's just so many areas that minor things can happen. Now, yes. like, I just, you could, like, little things like slip off a cliff or trip or well, I mean, go down the stairs. I literally had moments where I thought I was done. And, I mean, and, and there's no getting out. You're walking. Yeah. So there's, there's, no, there's, there's no, no helicopter up. There's no. none of that. I mean, you're you're screwed. You you got a bone sticking out. They're gonna figure out a way to like carry yeah. you out. So they gotta carry you out. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. And so it's, and I'm not, it's not a short carry either. It's not no. like get us to the main road. And I gotta tell you, I don't even know if I'd want to be carried because the oh, drops and, so and yeah, you oh. would be in so much pain. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I, I, I mean, they had first aid carried with us every time. The, the porters carried a whole giant first aid kit, which we didn't need, but they offered it to us. They would they would check with us, "Are you sick?" Because you have the altitude sickness to deal with, which can can screw with your mind definitely. And then you've got the, how your body relates to the food, the altitude, just your overall health. Are you in shape? And you know, your, your muscles walking. hurt. Yeah. And it, it, don't get me wrong. This is not like running a marathon. This is not like doing an Ironman. You have to be in decent shape to do it. Scott Scott was in pretty good shape, and he, he you know, he, he does. Scott's got this I was thing. the worst shape of anyone. Well, yeah, but you've got this thing where you need to make it from point A to point B, and nothing's going to stop you from getting to point B. Um, you know, that that's what Scott has. I don't have that. If I don't get to point B, I'm fine with it. I don't care. It doesn't matter. But I knew that I needed to be in good enough shape so that I could get. Well, and he also didn't have a choice. This isn't like, hey, let's, right. I'm going to turn back and go back. We, yeah. we started at point A and you had to get to point B because it wasn't like, you know, I could just turn around and go back. It was like you had, like, there was no stopping. Yeah. So, yeah. so I was worried about holding other people up. Because the, third, I, the third day was the toughest for me with the, the, the length of it. That was tough. So to end on a positive note, if yeah. you could say one sentence about why the listeners should do Machu Picchu. What would you say? I'll like give you the first one. It's one of the seven wonders of the world. I mean, it, it truly, when, when I researched that and, and you see these pictures and, and what's funny is Steve Scornia 
brought us a National Geographic. He visited us early in July, right before we left for the trip. And he was in the airport and he saw National Geographic and on the front cover of National Geographic was Machu Picchu and he bought both of us the magazine. Oh, I saw your picture. That I was still cool. got yeah, that yeah. magazine. That's going to be the, that's going to be the cover shot of the podcast. Yeah. By the way. And it's, it, it's great. That is awesome. I've got that, that, that picture. That was well done. And what's amazing is as beautiful as that picture is, it doesn't even compare to real life. Yeah. The fact that, you know, th there's a, a, a virtual reality of Machu Picchu coming out by these YouTubers called the Vagabond Brothers. And they travel the world and they just got a permit to do virtual reality. And I was looking at some of the photos and some of the footage that they had. And having just been there, even that doesn't do it justice. It's just this, this epic, you know, you look to your left and you see the side of a mountain. You look to you're straight ahead of you, and you see this uh, Huanu Picchu with the city of Machu Picchu right in front of you. And you look to your right, and there's four or five mountain ranges that you just came over, and that's it. It's not there's there's like people around you at this sun gate and stuff, and you can see a little bit of buses down below, but you don't see a city. You don't see anything. It's just if if I can tell you listeners one thing. You're not prepared for how gorgeous it is. So the, the, I didn't see that coming, actually. I didn't realize you had the views that you do. But oh. that was about 70 cents, by the way. Yeah. One sentence. Why? Why? The you experience. Can... I mean, it is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And anyone that's ever done it will always remember it and always talk about it. But well stated, by the way. <laughs> yeah, true or false, right? It's both. <laughs> well, guys, thank you for uh, thank you for the in-depth look at Machu Picchu. You've encouraged me. But now I can't go with you because you've already gone. But uh, well, let, let us know if there's pictures or stuff that we can share. And, and uh, it was really an unbelievable. Well, experience. what we'll do is I'll, I'll definitely grab some pictures for you. I'll put them in a photo gallery and I'll put a link on the site from the podcast. So we'll definitely. And I'll it. have a video up at some point in time of all this stuff. I've got some raw footage of my time lapses and stuff up on YouTube, but I'll put. I'm gonna edit it together. Hopefully this week. That's awesome. I will definitely hook you up with uh, some links. Yeah. Well, thanks for having us, Steve. Well, yeah, gentlemen, thank you it. for uh, and for hosting uh, this evening in your basement. <laughs> no, hey, show. hey, anytime. It's this was really fun. I appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, this isn't the, the last time that we're part of this podcast. <laughs> and, and for the listeners that uh, don't realize that there's a YouTube video, the, the man that's like hidden <laughs> from view. He gets in there every now and then. I, I, I like the Wilson on home improvement. I like <laughs> he just sticks his head over the fence. Yeah, exactly, at the top of my head. So it's all good. But thank you very much. And uh, listeners, go, go to Machu Picchu. You'll enjoy it. Yeah, we'll leave, we'll, uh, I'll give you some links to the company that we use and stuff like that. But again, if you want to just research, I did my research on TripAdvisor. And don't let it stop you. Again, I did not specifically look for a deal with a tour company. And I know a lot of people look for the best deal and stuff. I didn't look for a deal. I think we got a fair price. In fact, I think we got more than a fair price. You could probably go with one of the other outfitters. Oh, that's a good piece of advice. Okay. Find an outfitter that won't give you 30 people on your tour. Meaning we had a very small group and it was very well managed. We had great food. Yeah. But there were people, the tour groups out there with like 30 people with like 10 porters. And so their porters were kind of rushed and, and their tents weren't necessarily set up. You're going to be so stressed on this thing because you want to get from, you know, once you get to your campsite and stuff, you're going to be set up. And then if you want to go out and meet other people at other parties, that's what you want to do. But you don't want your tour company to have, be stretched. That's great advice. One thing I didn't think about, and you knew exactly how many were on your tour from the get-go. You will know prior. You know, a good tour company will let you know who's on the tour. Um, and, and they offered to, to hook us up so that we could talk with the two other people who we didn't know who were on the tour. We didn't take advantage of that. I think we shot a couple of emails back and forth, but there weren't a lot. But again, specifically, I chose this tour company because we had a small group. And it was good. The larger groups, I talked to some of the people on the tour, the larger groups just didn't have as much fun. Okay. It's not that they didn't have fun. They just didn't have as much fun. A hot tip for you there, listeners. Well, guys, thanks again for being on the show. And um, Thanks for having us. You have inspired me to do Machu Picchu. Uh, hopefully. Well, you're 50 years old, so the clock's ticking. Right now. <laughs> it's ticking, all right. They'll need to carry you like the Czech woman. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Well, that's a wrap, gentlemen. Thanks, Steve.